Well, welcome. I'm Esmeralda Kalle. I'm the curator. Our speaker today is Jean Kendler Jr. Hang on <laughs> Jean earned his PhD at the University of Connecticut with a dissertation on text and image in American comics. He earned his ML, I always say it's an MLIS, but it's an MSLIS. <laughs> which, is, which is really redundant. <laughs> at UIUC. He's published numerous articles on comics art, including including work from, sorry, including work for the Comics Journal, the International Encyclopedia of Childhood, the Comics of Charles Schultz, The Good Grief of Modern Life, <laughs> and most recently, a piece on Charles Atlas, Comics for Flex. He has taught histories of the graphic novel at Columbia College of Chicago, and he previously chaired the International Comic Arts Festival. A cartoonist himself, he creates abstract comics with a scenic text. Jean has worked at the Herskovitz Library, it's hard to believe, <laughs> for eight years and 11 months. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to the Herskovitz uh, for inviting me uh, and uh, academic engagement. Uh, what I'm going to do today is give you uh, a, an illustrated version of portions of an essay I wrote for this book, Integrating Pop Culture into the Academic Library, which is actually my first library publication. It's, but of course, it's got comics in it because that's what I do. But uh, when I saw a call for papers, this gave me the excuse to do what I had been telling Esmeralda I was going to do for years, uh, which was to write basically this essay. Uh, and when I saw this, when I saw the call for papers, I'm like, you have no excuse not to do this now. So I figured I was finally going to do this. So I'm going to kind of half read from the essay and half kind of freestyle. Uh, not rapping, though, because I can't, don't know how to rhyme. Uh, OK. so. Uh, witnessing the increased public interest in all things Africa with the phenomenal success of the film Black Panther, uh, the Herskovitz Library's curator, Esmeralda Kale, began to actively seek out and collect books and items of, of material culture, that's important, uh, uh, related to the character and the film, including t-shirts, which I forgot to bring out, coffee mugs, which you could see back there, and even sculpture, which you can see back there and even the Lego bust of Black Panther, which no, we have not put it together yet. Everything is still in bags. Uh, let's see, and not just the Panther himself, but the fictional history of Wakanda, the African nation over which T'Challa, the Black Panther rules, uh, holds powerful associations with actual histories and cultures from across the African continent. Our collection now includes an ever-growing variety of Black Panther-related items, uh, and some of this, all of you know already, but uh, uh, ever, uh, augmenting our already strong holdings in comics from and about Africa, which were highlighted by me in our fall 2015 exhibit, African Cartoon Art, Voices and Visions. And yes, I did sneak Black Panther into that exhibit because I knew the movie was coming out very soon. Uh, we have begun to use these Black Panther materials as well as other thematically related items in our collections in our public engagement and outreach. And we've been doing this for a long time. This was a visit by uh, Niles North students. Uh, we, include, we usually include a much reduced collection of such materials when we are visited by K through 12 groups. 
Again, it's usually the statue, which again is out there, that catches students' eyes first, but soon the students explore everything on the table, whether directly Black Panther related or otherwise. These exhibits represent our initial attempt to capitalize upon, upon the character's popularity and appeal in order to draw our visitors further into our African, in, into true African histories and cultures. Another example, for the 2018 Northwestern University Black Graduate Student Association Conference, Afrofuturism, Black to the Future, uh, we developed a very, very large display uh, of black, uh, 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 sorry, entitled Black Panther and African Futurism. Uh, the materials, including, an, uh, including the big old statue at the center, uh, attracted a lot of attention over the course of the day at the conference. Uh, and Florence Mugambi, our African Studies librarian, and myself uh, were there the whole day. And during the breaks, people would come uh, to visit the uh, exhibit because we had everything from uh, some of the action figures, like a guy over there, to books, to collectible card games, some of which were recommended by Drew over here. <laughs> Yes, you did contribute to that, whether you remember it or not. Uh, uh, oops. And uh, it actually, uh, 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 we had Afrofuturist novels, scholarship posters, games, and more. And people, again, would come back. And I'll, in a little bit later, I'll come back to that because we had one item in particular that one student in particular kept coming back to, and eventually we had a really, really interesting conversation about that. Uh, but yes, I did use a copyrighted character to create a poster, and I apologize profusely. Uh, but popular culture is also culture. And uh, as you can see here, Marvel characters are now actually appearing in actual Penguin Classics editions. This is the cover to the Black Panther Penguin Classics Edition. The paperbacks look like this. The hardcovers are garish with bright colors and like gold stamped foil and stuff. But I want the ones that look like Penguin Classics, darn it. Uh, so a little background on Black Panther itself. So here's, here's where the comics come in. Uh, Black Panther and Wakanda first appeared in issues 52 and 53 of Marvel Comics comic book series The Fantastic Four by the creative team of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby in 1966, I believe. Uh, the character is generally recognized as the first major black superhero in American comics, and there are several asterisks in that sentence. Uh, as was typical of such comic books at the time, the first encounter between the Fantastic Four and the Black Panther is a battle between the heroes, because that's how heroes always meet in the, in the Marvel Universe. Uh, the Black Panther, an African chieftain, that's a direct quotation, entices the team to journey to his home country of Wakanda by sending a toga, a toga wearing emissary, that's what they say he's wearing, uh, uh, bearing fantastic technology. The emissary promises that the Panther shall arrange the greatest hunt of all time in honor of your visit uh, of these four great heroes. However, in this hunt, the Fantastic Four become the prey as the panther attacks and very nearly defeats the heroes in battle, taking place inside a man-made jungle. T'Challa's emissary describes this place as follows, and this is the first view that we get of Wakanda in, in the comic books. The entire to to topography and flora are electronically controlled mechanical apparatus. Not apparata, apparatus. Uh, the very branches about us are composed of delicately constructed wires, while the flowers which abound here are highly complex buttons and dials. Even the boulders can be heard to hum with the steady pulse of computer dynamos. It's the mid-60s, all those things sounded really amazing to kids. <laughs> uh, once the fight is concluded to his satisfaction, T'Challa narrates his origin story. Unlike in the Marvel films, uh, in which King T'Chaka uh, T'Challa's father is killed in a terrorist attack. Here the villainous claw kills King T'Chaka. Uh, teenage T'Challa then takes non-lethal revenge on Claw and then takes on the mantle of King. After being educated in both Europe and America, he returns to Wakanda, sells enough vibranium to make himself rich, 
and uses his scientific knowledge to quickly turn Wakanda into an, from an agrarian society into a land of fantastic technology. But people still dress in grass skirts pretty much except for him. Uh, one detour, uh, comic book nerds are amazing in what they can dig up. This is the cover, this is the first cover of the first issue that had Black Panther in it. People found that this, what you see here, the face, originally his mask showed the bottom of his face. And you can see it also because there was a first version of the cover that wasn't used, which also shows the bottom of his face. But if they did that, that means that it was clear that Black Panther was in fact a black person. And that meant nobody in the South would put that book on their newsstands. So that's why Black Panther had a completely black face cowl. And I will say that I, there will be a trigger warning. Some of, the, some of the things we'll talk about eventually will be a little disturbing. Uh, this is the first version of the Black Panther before they actually figure out everything to do with him. He's the cold tiger. None of that makes any sense to me. <laughs> Black Panther himself makes little sense, but none of that. I don't, I don't know what any of that has to do with anything. There's a T and a C for apparently no reason. But, and, a, and again, notice there, his face is completely uncovered. So they, that was their first thought. This is a black hero. Let's make it clear. But economics and prejudice, which is tie, which walk hand in hand, uh, kind of dealt with that. The two of Wakanda's most defining characteristics are the fact that it was never colonized by European imperialists and the presence of the wonder metal vibranium. Both elements find their analogs in African history and culture, uh, presenting opportunities for introducing more items from our collection. For example, in the case of colonialism, uh, the only two nations not to be colonized, as was some people say, are, were Ethiopia and Liberia. Although the Italians were able to conquer and occupy Ethiopia from 1936 till 1941. Liberia was never officially colonized, but Liberia was effectively an American colony. Uh, and I had a quotation, I had a source for that quotation, and I unfortunately didn't, that didn't carry over, but neither of those is exactly correct. Uh, our collection includes a great deal of primary material dating from Ethiopia's brief occu Italian occupation. 1936 to 1941, from personal photo albums of invading soldiers to publications for children. Uh, we have one, and I do not have any Italian uh, for myself, so I'm just going to say that the title of this uh, periodical was Bimbi de Ogi Che, and it goes on from there. Uh, but it's an Italian children's school workbook published in 1936 at the beginning of the occupation. The cover depicts two white school children holding small Italian flags and examining a map of Ethiopia, superimposed over a military scene. On page 30, I wish I, I just didn't get a scan of this one in time. Page 30 offers a map of Ethiopia with the caption, and this is my rough Italian translation. Here's a map of East Africa so that you can, even during the holiday, remember military feats and follow the operations of our army. Political and cultural purveyors of fascist Italian imperialism saw in Ethiopia a chance to expand their military influence abroad while simultaneously indoctrinating Italian children to see these actions as natural and indeed patriotic. Liberia, on the other hand, was established in 1821 by the American Colonialization Society as an attempt to provide a home country for formerly enslaved persons from the United States and eventually the Caribbean islands. Uh, uh, Duane Wong uh, notes in one article that Liberia was effectively an American colony. Well, it was not just effectively, it was an American colony, at least at the start. And our collection includes documents and realia covering the entirety of Liberian history. Patrons interested in this unique African country can read early documents such as a tellingly titled, oh, no, not that, 
uh, a concise history of the commencement, progress, and present condition of the American colonies in Liberia by Samuel Wilkinson from 1839, or study 20th century political events through ephemeris, such as our materials related to Liberia's 1962 presidential election and inauguration. Uh, this is part of a larger display that we held several years, that we put up several years ago to welcome uh, June 2017 visit from Christine Tolbert Norman, who was at that time the mayor of, of Bentall City, Liberia, who was the daughter of William R. Tolbert Jr., who served as president of Liberia from 1971 to 1980. And you can learn more about this fan and Christine Tolbert Nelson in our VR exhibit in the back, uh, because this fan has been scanned and there's an interactive 3D model you can play with and you can hear Esmeralda talk about her experiences with Christine Tolbert Nelson, uh, sorry, uh, Christine Tolbert Norman and the fan and some other things about that. Uh, there are several ways that this, that this talk and that exhibit talk with each other uh, and I suggest that you play with that at some time. Those talks are also in the LibGuide, so you can watch those videos as well. Uh, the, the vibration absorbing and fictional metal vibranium introduced in Black Panther's second comic book appearance, Fantastic Four 53, plays a key role in Black Panther's origin story. In the film, as in the comics, a mountain of vibranium, an ancient meteorite, provides Wakanda with its wealth and enables its advanced technology. The only drawback is that because it is so powerful and therefore valuable, Wakandans feel that they must keep its existence secret from the rest of the world in the movie. In the comics, remember, uh, T'Challa sells it off all over the place to make a lot of money so that he can build technology for himself. So the movies and the comics don't always jive together very uh, carefully. Uh, well, well, but here's the thing. While vibranium itself is a fantasy, uh, quite, there's quite real and valuable mil mineral deposits are found across the African continent. And here's the first time I'm going to grab something from over here. Uh, for example, Tantalum, these are two government publications dealing with, one is this, one is from Nigeria, and one is from South Africa, but it's about tantalum and nobium in Zimbabwe. These are very, very dry technical reports. Uh, uh, tantalum is in great demand. Uh, tantalum, which is extracted from the or metallic or coal tan, is in great demand as a key component in, among other electronic devices, cell phones. So this is a magic mineral from, from Africa that every one of you has in your pocket right now. How is that not vibranium? <laughs> it, it, it even includes sound. Uh, however, in 2020, the Democratic Republic of Congo produced approximately 40% of the tantalum extracted that year across the world. In fictional Wakanda, there's no mention of the economic mining, of the enormous mining projects which must have been necessary to harvest so much vibranium like we see in the movies. However, as Michael Ness discusses in, in his book Coltan, his in-depth study of economic and political forces surrounding the ore, the reality of Coltan mining has been a complex and vile undertaking. And this is a quotation. A decade ago, virtually no one except geologists had heard of tantalite or coltan as it is known but in the Congo. Today it's discussed at the United Nations, in the media, at student teach-ins, and on activist websites, and is linked to some of the worst atrocities to blight the planet. Mass rape, slave labor, extrajudicial killings, and the illegal arms trade. So the cell phone, one of the most culturally transformative devices of the past two decades, relies on part on metal produced via exploitive work including by child laborers. laborers. Wakanda's vibranium-based technology carries, as far as we can tell, no such stigma. And now we're gonna make a 
big old U-turn and slide into Afrofuturism. Uh, and this brings us back to the comics for a little bit. Uh, written by Don McGregor and drawn primarily by African-American artist Billy Graham, the 1970s comic series Jungle Action Issues, collectively known as the Panther's Rage uh, epic storyline, uh, introduced the character of Eric Killmonger, uh, the very first issue of which features Eric Killmonger throwing Black Panther off of a, off of a waterfall and provides the basis for a lot of the original Black Panther film's plot and character motivations. For much of the film's cultural references and technology design, the filmmakers look to the then current Black Panther series, which began publication in 2016. Creators Tana Hesse Coates, writer, and Brian Steelfries, the artist and designer, consciously uh, framed Wakandan culture and technology in ways which avoided Western influence, a key influence in the literary and artistic movement known as Afrofuturism. So when you look at this and look at those, that first image we saw of what Wakanda looked like doesn't look very much the same. When asked in an interview about his inspiration for depicting Wakandan technology, Stelfreeze, the artist, explained, I think when you're being creative, you still attach it to, some, to reality somehow. I grew up in a small town in coastal Southern California, so, so, sorry, not South, Southern California, South Carolina. <laughs> a little different, Gene. Uh, where I'm from, the people are known as Gullah people. They're some of the first freed slaves that lived on their own without being attached to the rest of the United States. They kind of developed their own culture, so they do things a bit different. Uh, the artist's embrace of Gullah is significant in our context today. Uh, considered to be the first professionally trained African-American linguist, uh, Lorenzo Dal Turner was an expert in the Gullah language, publishing Africanisms in the Gullah dialect in 1949. His papers constitute one of the Herskovitz Library's most requested archival collections. These two boxes just happen to be in the office right over there because we've had somebody here for the past like two months who's been studying just these two boxes. Uh, they include scores of interviews with Gullah speakers from which he determined, according to the publisher's promotional website, that Gullah drew important linguistic features directly from the languages of West Africa. Stelfries also notes, one of the things I try to do with Wakanda is to make the country all of Africa, which is what the movie does as well. Uh, pulling from different cultures and even eras all over Africa. The Wakandan soldiers, what would be the police, are influenced by Zulu warriors and Maasai warriors, even doing little things like most of the rooms are round or curved. I want everything to feel like we're in Africa. But it also pulls back, but it also pulls from black culture in terms of the black hair, the various haircuts will have everyone see black people that they recognize. I want to keep the facial structure and the lines to where you can say, yep, these are definitely black people. Uh, an, another comic that kind of spins off from Black Panther and the movie to a certain extent as well is Shuri, written by world fantasy Hugo and Nebula award-winning Niger-American author Nnedi Okorafor, a Chicago native, although she no longer lives here, whose parents immigrated from Nigeria. Instead of Afrofuturism, Okorafor refers to his work as to her work as African futurism, emphasizing her work's conscious evocation and extrapolation of explicitly African themes, traditions, and concerns. Shuri, the character, is the genius stem embodying sister of T'Challa, the Black Panther. Okorafor and artist Leonardo Romero begin with a story rooted in both technology and Shuri's relationship with the elephant's foot, a group of women who advise the country's ruling council who meet beneath the giant boabab tree. Exhibiting these comics affords the opportunity to discuss the historical significance of the ancient boabab tree, including its role in creation myths and as a home for the spirits of the ancestors. The diverse group of women who comprise the elephant's foot invites an investigation into studies of how women serve politically today, such as Maggie Madimbo's recent study of indigenous women leaders in Malawi who are guided by, quote, an interaction of African spirituality and resiliency, which forms the inner character of the individual that results in servant and transformational relationship behavior, leader, sorry, leadership behavior. In addition, Suri's STEM connection allows us to highlight the collection items which focus in particular on science and education. And we've got a couple of those here. Uh, actually, here's a book uh, that people of Namibia's Eastern Zimbabwe region 
which, else, which actually features an entire section on the Boabab tree and its importance in culture. It goes on for several pages. That's actually featured on the title page as a, and, and a, the most, as one of the most important sections in the book. Here's a African, is a, is a African comic book about Simbi the inventor, women in STEM. And this is an, actually an older book from 1990, I believe. Yes, it is. Women Two in Science and Technology in Africa. It's a study from 1990. But again, if you're interested in Shuri, that kind of leads you potentially to be interested in items like that. Don't trip over the cord, Gene. Uh, another of Okoro Four's comics, LaGuardia, which is up here straight in the front, uh, takes place in an imagined future in which Lagos welcomed, Earth first vi welcomed Earth's first visitors from other planets. Along with artists Hannah Ford and James Devlin, Okoro Four creates, crafts a tale which centers around immigration, prejudice, and neo biafranism uh, the story's title refers, of course, to New York's LaGuardia Airport, a site where Okorafor herself has experienced difficulties with customs and immigration officials upon returning from trips to Nigeria and other countries in Africa. Uh, and I'm sure the Transportation Library probably has some information on LaGuardia Airport. <laughs> just to, if you're interested in that, you can just take a walk down the hall and find some more about that as well. Uh, Let's see. In this story, LaGuardia is only one of a handful of our airports and immigration sites on Earth with interplanetary travel services. But those services do not come without prejudice and sometimes hatred. Here we go. Hugo Canudo is a Brazilian artist who I discovered on Instagram. Uh, he reinterprets the, the Orishas, the Yoruba gods, in the study in the style of artist Jack Kirby, who co-created not only Marvel's Black Panther and Thor, but also created on his own many of the DC characters which now constitute the greater underlying mythology that uh, the, the uh, uh, DC characters which now constitute the greater underlying mythology of the comics and cinematic universe, Dark Side, things like that. Um, so, and I, when he saw, when he posted that, any, any comics nerd worth their salt knew immediately that that was a homage to Avengers number four, where Captain America gets thawed from the ice. This is 1963-ish. Um, and you'll notice down here, you notice that he's reproduced these, these different characters. Uh, the poses are the same things like this. Here you've got Thor wielding his hammer. Here you've got another character wielding a hammer in the same, in the same way. Uh, that character is Shango, who, among other things, is a Lord of Thunder. Uh, but you can learn a lot more about Shango in our VR exhibit, an AR exhibit in the back there. Uh, with, from a video by uh, Antoine Bird, who's now a faculty member, who was a graduate student here and is now a faculty member here, uh, with this wood sculpture by uh, uh, Felix Edebor. The, the sculpture is on display back there, but we luckily have with us this 3D printed replica of the sculpture, which we put up at night when, because we don't have the we, we, the case isn't uh, se secure enough to put the actual sculpture, uh, to leave the things up overnight. Uh, you'll notice it looks a little different uh, because what, uh, what uh, Hugo Canudo is doing is he's using the visual, the visual language, the visual uh, heroic, uh, uh, visual, uh, visual uh, epic storytelling techniques and visual motifs of Jack Kirby at his Kirbyist, <laughs> at his most, as at his most exaggerated. And you can see exam examples of this on the uh, posters that we have up here on either side. Here I've got more down here. Uh, again, we got Shango there. 
Uh, and here's where I go back to that uh, Black Graduate Student Association conference in 2018. Uh, one of the one of the, the one of the conference attendees kept coming back, going through the portfolio, and she kept stopping at this image. And like the third time, uh, I just had to walk up to her because it was clear something was going on, and I was like, "Can I ask you why this is so interesting to you? Because you keep doing this." And she said, "I'm from Brazil." And I see representations of her all the time. In my head, I know the stories. In my head, she is what I picture. <coughs> she is not what I see when I see her represented in my culture. And she pulled out her phone, and she did some Googling, and she showed me what she sees represented. Not quite the same. And she was so, it was like she was overjoyed to see this. And I saw, the, I saw Canuto's uh, enterprise as kind of a really neat, nice kind of like cultural melding but I didn't realize the power that it had within it. I, I knew that there was a kind of power, but I didn't know the kind of cultural underpinning of that power. But she was really moving. When she showed me that, I was like, I cannot fathom that they took these Yoruba gods and turned it into that. And this, 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 this character in particular gets this treatment. Um, he, he eventually moved on from just doing these posters. I've got, there's more of them over here. He did a series of, I think, 16. And Esmeralda started uh, communicating with him and purchased all those posters. Uh, he's in, the, the artist himself is in Brazil. Uh, he eventually published a book uh, in Portuguese. And it was just last month published in English as Tales of the Orishas, which we just got in our collection now. I've read it. It reads, if you've read like Jack Kirby's Fourth World comics, like The New Gods and things like that, it's pretty much the same. It's, it, it reads on that level. It's high epic drama. Uh, and I will need to read it a few more times because there are a lot of characters. I mean, it's, it starts with a creation myth as all good things do. <laughs> and it, it goes through, a, it, it, was a, it was a little hard keeping track of the characters, but it, he even goes through uh, with some of his process in the back and things like this. It's super fascinating stuff. Uh, and I just, uh, I can't get enough. He says there's, he's working on the volume two. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but I've got a deeper appreciation for what he's doing mostly because of my interaction with that graduate student. I was just really, really fascinated. Another similar thing we have, uh, now we have this here, but we have the painting over there. We've got a representation out there. So you're just overwhelmed by this. Uh, this is Denny Au, who uh, his specialty is taking popular, <laughs> was taking popular culture figures, uh, often American popular culture figures, and repainting them using, uh, putting them in uh, dress from different cultures from across the continent of Africa. Uh, this, this was not the first piece we got from him. The first piece we got uh, were for, like we have Zulu Flores and a few other pieces dealing with Barack and Michelle Obama and the whole, and the whole family also. Uh, another artist we discovered on Instagram. And Esmeralda reached out. And uh, so as you can see on this one again, this is one of 25, because he, what he does is he, these are half paintings and half photo collages, and then they're printed on canvas. So when you can look at the original over there, that's a, that's a print on canvas.
and when he did this one originally, uh, uh, the original version of this starts here and ends there. And he got a lot of flack from people saying, where's M'Baku? You need M'Baku. <laughs> so he added M'Baku to the end. But uh, we have lots and lots of other artworks across uh, in the collection of all kinds. Uh, there's no way to pretend to show all of them right now. But uh, there's just, just wanted to show some of that. A uh, few more things uh, a little more quickly. Uh, the Dora Milaje, the Kingsguard in the Black Panther movies. Uh, <laughs> these feature fe prominently in the films. And they were introduced in the comic books. They were a little different. Uh, in 1998, uh, written by Christopher Priest and drawn by Mark Texera. Uh, the Doors have long hair and short red dresses, uh, which the casino scene uh, in the first movie, the horrible disguise, uh, I think is a nod to this. But uh, there's a, it's, it's, it's just, read, I'm not gonna bother to read all the captions, it's just, it's just, there's, they're, they're meant to be like potential brides. It's not flattering at all. But as so often is the case with superhero comic books, subsequent stories and creators expand and revise the history in the current state of the Dora Milaje, eventually transforms them into what became the visual character basis for the film incarnation. And uh, very quickly, uh, people started to realize that the Dora Milaje weren't just a comic book creation as well. There, there, was, there was some historical uh, uh, basis behind them. And one of the places that uh, wrote a really good early piece on it was in Teen Vogue. And don't laugh because Teen Vogue is one of the smartest places on the internet. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Uh, uh, they wrote that uh, the, the Dora Milaje bear not a little resemblance to the warriors whom 18th century Europeans dubbed the, the, Dahomey, the Dahomey Amazons. And the, the Dahomey Amazons uh, were featured in a, a series put up by UNESCO. They did this whole series of women in Africa. The website no longer exists, which makes me angry. Uh, because they had like downloadable graphic novels with supplemental materials including soundtracks and all this other stuff. Archive.org did grab the stuff. It didn't unfortunately grab the resource document, the, 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 the reference to this document. I think I did grab it though. I've, I got to check my own files. But uh, we do have a, co a print copy of, of the book at least. So we do have that. But uh, if you saw The Woman King, by any chance, that is a, uh, it's a much more realistic depiction of, of the Dahomey Amazons. Again, and that's what they were called. We have some information about them. Uh, there's this book, uh, Stanley Alpern's Amazons of Black Sparta. This is a more uh, fairly recent discu uh, dis uh, analysis and history of them. Uh, this book here uh, reproduces a book published in 1778. Uh, and when I say reproduces, I mean it's a, it's a really, really bad scan. <laughs> it's, it's illegible. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> However, we have an original 1778 printing, which is like it was printed yesterday. But we may be doing, we may, we may be talking to Gail about this, because this is just ridiculous. Uh, but again, the beauty of a place like the Herskovitz, in theory, is that you don't always have to get the Origi you, you don't have to necessarily get the original printing if something like this exists. 
as long as it's not a piece of junk. <laughs> and also, this book that just came out, Black Panther, A Cultural Exploration, looks like one of those books made to make a buck. But it's by Natasha Womack, who's an Afrofuturist scholar. She's amazing. And she's got a whole section on the Dora Milaje and the Dahomey Amazons. And it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing yet because it just came in. But uh, this book is not what it looks like on the outside. Uh, and when I heard she did it, I was like, oh, wait, maybe this is going to be good. And it actually is. Uh, OK. Wrapping up here, kind of. Wakandan speech. When characters in the Black Panther film appear to speak Wakandan, they're in fact speaking, I cannot pronounce this correctly, forgive me, uh, uh speech a language in one of the official languages of South Africa, which was suggested by the actor John Connie, who portrays King T'Chaka in the films, uh, originally in uh, Captain America Civil War. And let's just listen to a little bit of that. Well, please be seated. This is something you now in session. That is the future calling. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Again, do I trust the day? We come to share the We So uh, spoken Wakandan is actually a spoken African language. It's just not Wakandan. Uh, when you see written Wakandan, it's actually a, it's, it's actually a substitution cipher. Written Wakandan is based, well, I'll, I'll say here, uh, it's a highly geometric and stylized which cor which, with corresponding English letter equivalents. These typefaces were produced by Hannah Beecher, the film's production designer. According to a profile, there are two written languages in Black Panther, one based on the ancient Nigerian language of Nsibidi. I apologize, I have horrible pronunciation on everything, including English sometimes, which dates as far back as the fourth century and a more evolved version that Beecher developed with great imagination. It was a secretive language based on pictography, so it was about how you put the symbols together and the image you create. Note that while the letter forms are derived from Sibidi, the individual characters are used in the film as an alphabetic substitution in English words. So when in the movie, in the movie it will say, it will give you like a, a caption that tells you where you are. You'll see it first in Wakanda, and then the letters slowly switch to English. Uh, we have this amazing book, African Alphabets, the story of writing in Africa. And I've helpfully uh, flagged the section where the author talks about that script. Um, this book is amazing. There's no other book like it. We have two different editions of it. It costs a ton. Otherwise, I would buy a copy myself. Uh, it's super fascinating. Uh, but, and if you want to learn how to speak Wakandan yourself, whether you're a child or if you're a little older, <laughs> we have uh, books that will help you do that as well. Uh, uh, Eric Killmonger's Dying Wish. This is where we're just about to end here. Spoiler, sorry. Uh, <laughs> just bury me in the ocean. But my ancestors that jumped from the ships. Because they knew death was better than bondage. Mm. That's a really powerful scene. 
And what makes it even more powerful is knowing that it's 100% true and that we have not only things like uh, the book Tom Feeling's Middle Passage, which uh, has, which is a, it's a wordless book that describes the Middle Passage from one shore to the other. And it includes in one place this amazing scene here, which relies on this very well-known diagram description of a slave ship, which we don't own a copy of this print, but a lot of places do. And we've got, it's, it's in a lot of databases that we own and things like this. But if you look here, what he's done with that diagram, he's made that into a human body with the head and the feet there. And he also has, it, it's mostly, it's, it's a picture book primarily, but there's one page that's arguably comics and it depicts people jumping from the ships. And uh, I'm not gonna hold it up anymore because it's pretty difficult, but uh, jumping from the ships and what happens when you jump to shark infested waters. Uh, so what, what Killmonger says there is not just a speech, it's history. And not only that, we have an eyewitness account of the same thing from 1788 in this book, which is from 1788, an account of the slave trade of the coast of Africa by Alexander Falconbridge, late surgeon of the African trade. He's not a fan. He's appalled by what he sees. And he describes exactly what that page shows and what Killmonger had just said in that film. It, when I found this, so I found this before I even saw this, and I was like, oh my God, everything he says there, but it's, the detail is just, it's, I, I just had to stand back because it was like, it wasn't just that they did it, it was how the place is set up and why, and I've got everything out there, but I'm not gonna read it. Anyways, okay. These connections and more constitute an entire program's worth of information, like this, relating to the African continent's many histories and cultures. Our materials also reflect the Herskovitz Library's growing focus on material culture. They join our extensive Africa Embracing Obama collection, like the Zulu Flotus, which is now viewable in our, in our online repository. Yay! Uh, as well as many other non-print based items from across the continent. We look forward to more interactions with Black Panther fans, young <laughs> and not so young, uh, and so that we can help transform fanish zeal into intellectual curiosity by creating a conversation. What do you like most about the Black Panther and Wakanda history? Politics, fashion, didn't even get to that, uh, science, heroic tales, languages, comics, Let's show you some genuine African materials that'll make the Black Panther story resonate in ways you might never have considered. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. So you, you mentioned that discovering a couple of artists through Instagram. Is yeah. this like, you know, do you have certain people that you follow that, you know, like aggregate artists or, or is there like an account that's dedicated to like African art or something where you found them? No. Um, sometimes Instagram will pop up things because you like other things. And uh, Sometimes it, sometimes it pops up through the Herskovitz account, sometimes it pops up through my account because there are overlapping uh, interests between the two. Uh, honestly, I don't know, I couldn't tell you which account I found these through, uh, but uh, I, my interests are too varied, so things just pop up, but uh, like I, 
I'm pretty sure that both of these were, like, uh, Denny Au and Hugo Canuto were both suggestions. Because I don't know how I would have discovered them otherwise because they're not, uh, especially Hugo Canuto because he was, uh, I think he was like an architect primarily and this started off as like a side gig. Or maybe one of my comics friends found that and reposted it. That could be. <coughs> be just because that's so nerdy. It's <laughs> so nerdy. And I saw that and I'm like, but it's nerdy, but it's relevant to my job. <laughs> and that's always fun. And finding, finding like the Zulu Flores was like, it was just beautiful. And it's relevant to my job. And again, it does interest, it's not just nerdy and relevant, but it does something interesting. It's, 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 it's like a, it's a cultural mashup sort of, but uh, that, those mashups often, if they're done well, they're trying to say something more than just, look at these two things. And it's trying to, recont it, they're, both, they're both recontextualizing things in different ways. But, so that's a very long answer to say, I'm not really sure. The algorithm. It's the algorithm, yeah. Sometimes the algorithm is Plus nice. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it does. Uh, I think it's pretty sneaky smart to use pop culture to draw people to deeper themes and deeper materials. Right, speaking so, are there ways beyond your book chapter and talks like this to uh, leave out more fish hooks for people to find uh, the Herskovitz and materials here through things like Black Panther and other pop cultural uh, representations that might be here? Is there more? Can you do more, Gene? That's really the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think we're always trying to do more. Um, I suppose one thing we could do is kind of like a more like a pairing things like for posts and things like that. Take a pop, a pop culture thing and a less pop culture thing that have uh, similarities uh, to do that. Um, are there other stronger, or maybe not as strong as you know, a Marvel property, but other pop cultural uh, hooks that you could plumb here? I don't know how, well, I don't want to put you on the spot for that, I'm sorry. Well, there's, I mean, music always, music can be, music can be helpful. Um, as Esmeralda, can you think of other things? I mean, we've, I mean, we've got, there's so much. There is so much. <laughs> there is so much. Um, it's hard to say. We did hair, which might not be pop culture, mm -hmm. but it, it, well, current it, interest in hair, it took us back into the history of hair. Fa yeah, fashion, fashion, fashion and pop culture. Yeah. Yeah. Cooking. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cooking. Cooking. Yeah, co yeah we, we've, we've done food also, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it, there, there's pop culture and then there's pop culture. And it's, yeah, I mean, if you're looking at branded things, that's one thing. But if you're looking at popular culture with a small pop, I think it's a little easier to, uh, to do that. Because I don't want to just show for Disney. <laughs> <laughs> that's the last thing I'll. That's the last thing I wanted to do. Yes? Yeah, hi, um, I, this uh, presentation uh, would be of, of wider interest. <laughs> I mean, you have this group, which is wonderful, we're very privileged here, but uh, I think it, this would be of really wide interest. <laughs> I mean, I could really see this being videotaped with us. <laughs> it's a. Uh, if, if you look to your left. <laughs> oh! <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, you, you, you're in one of the worst seats to notice that. <laughs> it, it, will be, it, will be, it will be going up. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be putting that out there. Uh, but if you, can, if you can invite me to other places that could do it and could maybe if you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you know of other places that it would 
work. The, 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 the benefit of doing it here is that I have all of these things at, we have all this stuff at our fingertips, literally. It's hard to do something like this in another location because to bring, especially the rare items, elsewhere becomes just, it's logistically more difficult. Uh, and since we did hear from several people that they would have liked to attend, uh, Esmeralda was uh, kind enough to set up uh, videotaping for this so that we can get it out there more broadly. But uh, thank you for your, uh, for the vote of confidence. <laughs> I, I, no, I, on, no, honestly, I really do appreciate that. And uh, I, that means a lot. So thank you, thank you for that. Anyone else? I can, I can go deep nerd on any of this stuff. <laughs> or not even nerd. OK, well, again, thanks, everybody, for spending the last hour of work, if you work here. Uh, if you have not been to the Herskovitz before, I know some of you have not. Welcome. Please grab a flyer or, or one of our brochures. Grab a pencil on the way out, which is where the water is. It's our only swag. So <laughs> grab a pencil. Uh, if you'd like to take a look around, we're open to the public. We're always open to the public. Uh, there's lots to see on the, open, on the open shelves. We have a lot of rare stuff, which you can always request to come in. The pub, where anybody can request anything. Uh, so uh, please make use of this, this place. We're, we have guests all the time. We love having guests. That's like, that was the worst part of COVID, is that even when we came back to work, no, we had no visitors. And that honestly was the hardest part of the job because suddenly we did not have that energy of people coming and the, the energy of working with people. Like, like, like when I show the, the two boxes from the uh, Lorenzo, uh, uh, the, 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 yeah, the Dal Turner collection, I had a great conversation with the researcher two days ago. Today's Wednesday. Yes, two days ago, Monday. Uh, and she was talking about his work and how he was so interested in the philology of the people that he was interviewing that uh, even in this published book, he, he talked to all these people, but the information about the people is almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. The stories themselves barely get discussed. It was more about just the, the words and not the content of the stories. And, and reading and going through the archive was able, she was able to come to a better understanding of that. She was able to come to a better understanding of the, of the published work and to see how the methodology kind of uh, resulted in that. But she could also read the stories as well and draw more from that. And just being able to talk to researchers I learn, I mean, I'm no expert on anything, but I've learned so much from just working with researchers. It's not just grabbing boxes. There's a lot of grabbing boxes, but being able to talk to people about their research is always interesting. So come on in. <laughs> and thank you all for coming in now. Thanks. And <laughs> it's all done. <laughs>